I wanted to hand it over to the amazing Jeff Cooper to talk about the state of AI for images, to kind of give us a portrait uh, of the landscape uh, of AI right now. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, well, okay. First thing I want everyone to appreciate is how quick we've developed these tools and how amazing they've gotten in the last 10 years. This is a comic from a, a publisher called XKCD, if you're familiar with that, where eight years ago, this was a joke. And this, in this comic, the business person is asking their engineer, we need to create an app that when a user takes a photo, it should check if they're in a national park. And the engineer says, oh, that's easy. We'll, you know, we'll do a, do a quick global positioning lookup and just give me a few hours. Then he says, we need to also check if it's a photo of a bird. And she says that she needs a research team in five years. Well, she must have gotten the research team in five years because nowadays, even though we used to laugh at this before, and you can go to the next slide, Dan, this is very easy to do. With this example on the right is an image classifier where you can put in a picture of a dog and have the technology figure out what breed of dog that is. This is an example from a company called Fast AI where a student in school, a college level student, built this tool in about 25 minutes using the existing libraries and, and data sets we have. So we've gone from the last eight years this being a, a, a joke to being able to do something like this very quickly and then being able to do generative AI. I don't know if you've seen the Pope in the puffer jacket. This was an image created with MidJourney and a little bit of Photoshop that went viral around the internet. Uh, this is not a real picture. But not all of AI for images is generative. So in this lesson, we're talking a lot about using AI to generate unique photography. But in the wild, we also use a lot of image-focused artificial intelligence to do things like machine vision. So if you drive a Tesla or another electric car, all these autonomous vehicles rely on AI to process imagery. You see that in things like medical imaging. We've been able to make just shocking advancements in things like cancer detection using these tools, as well as things like security surveillance, or if you've seen any of the prototype Amazon grocery stores that were hot for a while, where you don't actually even need to check out or scan things because the machine is watching you shop. These are all examples of artificial intelligence for image in the wild. We're going to spend most of our time today on generative AI, but I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of how it's being used in other scenarios. One of the things that's important to realize is images are data. They are not just visuals. We as humans see the pictures, but under the hood, an image is basically a, a two-dimensional space of all these different numbers that correspond to the colors of things. Um, what's interesting is we've actually been using image detection to do things you wouldn't realize an image detector is used for. So for instance, on the left, what you have is what's called an audiograph. So this is sound turned into an image over time. What we found in the last three years is that it's easier to detect certain sounds like gunshots or children playing through image detection, as opposed to using the historic tools we would use to actually listen to and process audio. So on the left-hand side, you've got an example where some researchers turned the sounds into images and were able to produce state-of-the-art results for detecting dangerous things like a gunshot. On the right-hand side, you're actually seeing a similar thing where somebody took someone's mouse movements on a website and turned it into an image that traces where the mouse goes, puts a dot if somebody clicks, and the color corresponds to how fast the mouse was using or moving rather. This, in this example, we were actually able to create state-of-the-art robot detection by actually looking at the data and using image processing techniques and artificial intelligence to take this, this domain of imagery and apply it to a lot more things in the wild. So, so there's very cool applications here if you get creative. Um, so how does this stuff work? Just like our large language models, all of this stuff is being driven by what's called a neural network. Essentially, these machines are trained. They take a bunch of pictures and imagery that are labeled, and they feed them through this large series of machines and math functions that creates a certain output predicting what a given image is. The, the way the machines do this, and you can go to the next slide, is they, they essentially break down an image into all of its core components. So the first layer of a neural network might look for gradients in colors or, or gradients in the image. The second layer might start looking for certain patterns like stripes. The third layer might start looking for more specific patterns like we're seeing circles or squares. The fourth layer starts to get very sophisticated looking for things like faces, et cetera. And fundamentally, this is how these machines take an image and classify it as, oh, this is a dog or a human or a car. And that was really the state of the union for how image AI was being used. But then we started reversing that process. So we said, okay, well, if we say we want a dog, a picture painting of a dog playing poker, 
uh, how do we do that? And the machine started reversing it. And so it knew what an eye looked like and it would start to extract that back up similar to image, image classification works to create these pictures. Well, when that happens, it gets very weird because the machine knows what an eye looks like, but it might produce something like this where you can see here you have what maybe looks like dogs if you're squinting or, or standing very far from your computer, but it's also the thing of nightmares where you see that we've got eyeballs and noses all over the place. And it's a machine, this is Google DeepMind, where it knew very well what a dog's snout and eyeball looked like, but it did a bad job of extracting that to a full picture. So this is essentially where we are right now. What image, what image AI tools do really well, like in Nicole's example, is when they're trained to do a very specific function. So right now, some of the best tools that are easy to use off the shelf for a business person have some specific use cases like this remove.bg is a tool for just removing backgrounds from images. You also, if you use Photoshop or Adobe AI, you're starting to see that these companies are incorporating AI power tools into their workflow. Um, so there are another set of examples here that when we send out these, uh, these videos, you can review as well. Yeah, a couple of quick notes. First of all, amazing, Jeff. Uh, I I think it's it's really easy to stop to not stop and ask, like, how does this plane fly? You know, how does generative AI for images work? Because it's a little different uh, than what what it, the way it works for text. It's a lot of the same uh, processes, but you know, the way it breaks down the images by layers. Uh, very well done. Two things here. One is. When you talk about AI for text, you can get a lot done with ChatGPT, which is a free tool. Uh, Jasper is a paid tool, it's a great one. Um, when you talk about AI for images, it gets a little bit more software-y. And so we're gonna start talking about more types of software. And when next week, uh, in two weeks from now, I should say uh, in unit uh, five, when we talk about AI for audio and video, it gets very, very niche software. And so we, part of the kind of evolution that we're taking you through is from not very software dependent, you know, a chat based uh, framework to more software dependent. And as uh, Olivier is going to talk about, you know, the need for also, you know, more advanced editing skills in the Photoshop or Illustrator to touch up the product that's being produced. Um, all of these, uh, elements, these eight uh, photo enhancement software, the remove.bg will be included in a resource list that you'll get next week uh, as a thank you for coming live. And we only give those resources to folks who attend live. So I do hope you make it.